Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Dana Clark. I'm a marine ecologist at the Cawthron Institute. So today I'm going to tell you uh, about a few of the co-benefits of seaweed aquaculture and hopefully this will set the scene for uh, Zoe and Andrew who are speaking next um, and they're going to delve into a few New Zealand specific studies looking at some of these benefits. So the information in this presentation comes from a report that we wrote for Sustainable Seas uh, looking at the environmental effects of seaweed aquaculture. Um, and Rob, Rob mentioned these reports before, so there was three reports. The other looked at the market uh, and regulatory environment um, for seaweed aquaculture in New Zealand. And then there was a report looking at the potential of different seaweed species for aquaculture uh, and the role of Māori in this emerging seaweed sector. So these formed um, the background to the um, seaweed sector framework that Rob presented earlier today. So our report uh, looked at the current literature um, and summarised uh, the environmental effects, both positive and negative, of seaweed aquaculture and tried to put it into a New Zealand context. So this figure um, kind of summarises what we found, so the green plus signs are the potential benefits, um, the negative, uh, the red negative signs, minus signs are potential negative effects. Um, and today I'm just going to focus on a few of the potential co-benefits to try and um, demonstrate the full value that this industry could offer. Um, but there's heaps more uh, if you want to go look at the report. Um, yeah, I think that was all. So um, seaweed is primarily grown to produce uh, biomass uh, to be used to create food products or a range of other things like fertilizers or nutraceuticals or animal feed but there's a range of different co-benefits that could occur alongside this. So one of these co-benefits is bioremediation so this refers to the ability of seaweeds to remove metals or contaminants or excess nutrients from the water uh, as they grow and um, cultivating seaweed uh, specifically for bioremediation primarily occurs in land-based systems uh, like the ones in these photographs whereas uh, ocean-based seaweed farming tends to focus on producing biomass and then bioremediation is just a secondary benefit. So the bioremediation potential depends on what species you're farming, uh, the scale of your farm and the environmental conditions. Uh, and in New Zealand, where coastal eutrophication isn't widespread, um, the, f the full potential of bioremediation is unlikely to be fully realised unless you're farming um, seaweeds specifically for this purpose in a land-based system, um, as we saw earlier today, uh, or you're farming it alongside other species in an integrated multi-trophic aquaculture setup, uh, or you do end up placing your farm in a, in a highly eutrophic uh, location. Another co-benefit that's often talked about with seaweed aquaculture is this, its potential to um, take up carbon. So as seaweed grows it um, takes up carbon from the seawater and it puts it into its tissues um, and then this prompts the ocean to draw down more carbon into the seawater uh, with potential climate change benefits. Uh, but these benefits, these climate change benefits, will only be realised um, if that carbon is stored long term. And uh, the length of time that the carbon is stored depends on the fate of the seaweed. So if the seaweed is turned into a food product, um, that carbon is going to be uh, released back into the atmosphere when the food is eaten and uh, you breathe out. Uh, but if it's turned into a more durable product, product like a bioplastic for example, and the carbon's going to be stored for longer. So unless carbon specifically, I mean seaweed is specifically farmed for the purposes of carbon sequestration, it's probably likely that um, a lot of the carbon will be released later on at some stage throughout the life cycle of the product. Um, but despite this transient nature of carbon sequestration, um, there is benefits, uh, climate change benefits, if seaweed-based products are used to uh, replace commodities that have higher greenhouse gas footprints. So for example, re replacing um, fossil fuels with seaweed-based biofuels, 
um, or um, developing food products that reduce methane emissions in cattle. Some, some of the carbon that's taken up by seaweed uh, might end up stored in the ocean. So this can occur when um, parts of the seaweed plant break off. Uh, and if they end up being buried in the sediments or exported to the deep sea, then they're considered to be stored uh, long term. And so if, if the fragment makes it to the deep sea, that's um, stored in, t in, in, you know, for a few centuries. Um, and then if it makes it to the seafloor sediments, it's kind of unknown at this stage exactly how long that will be uh, stored for. Um, so that's the, this kind of pathway here. Carbon uh, can also be released from seaweeds in the form of dissolved organic carbon. So this is just um, dissolved carbon molecules that are in the water. Most of this gets eaten by microbes, so it's just a short-term um, storage of carbon, but a little bit will make it to the seafloor and out to the deep ocean to be stored long-term. There's a lot of um, ongoing debate about how much carbon is actually stored by seaweeds. Um, but this reputable study estimates that about 10% of the carbon that's taken up by a wild seaweed bed um, would end up being stored long term in, in sediments or in the deep ocean. Um, we don't know if carbon sequestration pathways in um, farm seaweeds will be different. So there's differences like a farm is likely to harvest um, their seaweed product before they lose too much of it. So the amount of fragments that you get breaking off could be different to um, what you might get in a natural system. But conversely, um, seaweed farms are more likely to be located over soft sediments, so any fragments that do break off uh, have a greater chance of being incorporated into the sediment uh, compared to a natural system which um, grows on rocky reefs so you don't get that carbon sequestration. So there's still a lot more research to be done on exactly how much carbon is taken up by farm seaweeds, but it's going to depend on how close your farm is to undisturbed soft sediments um, or the deep ocean, what species you're farming and the stage of growth at which you're harvesting them. So large, uh, long-lived species have greater potential to take up carbon and species that have um, buoyancy mechanisms, they've got more potential to end up drifting out into the deep ocean. Seaweed farms can also provide habitat by offering three-dimensional structure uh, and a food source. Um, but this habitat value is likely to be different to um, the habitat provided by a finfish or a shellfish farm because um, seaweed cultivation doesn't increase food supply to the same extent. And it's also likely to be different to what you might find in a wild seagrass uh, bed because most of your biomass is suspended uh, rather than attached to the seafloor, so bed thick animals don't have the same ease of access to it. Uh, luckily we've got some research being carried out in New Zealand about the habitat value of seaweed, uh, farmed seaweed, and so hopefully um, Andrew will share some of the findings from his work on this um, after me. But yeah, the long-term value of this habitat, because it's harvested, it's really going to depend on the harvesting practices and the availability of suitable natural habitats nearby. And then the types of animals or plants that will support will depend on the culture method, the intensity and scale of farming, uh, and what species you have present in your area. There's um, a range of other potential co-benefits of seaweed agriculture. These include coastal protection, um, the ability of seaweed farms to enhance the ecosystem resistance or resilience, uh, and a range of cultural and social benefits, um, for example, in employment opportunities. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have time to go through them all here. Um, but I, I would just like to point out that um, with seaweed agriculture, all of these benefits and these risks, which I haven't gone over today, but they're all very uh, interlinked. And so if you change or you focus or enhance one, and this could affect the, the supply and delivery of others. And sometimes this can be positive. So if you think about um, if you're growing more seaweed on your farm to produce biomass to create commodities, this is going to have potential benefits for bioremediation, carbon sequestration, and habitat provision. Uh, but sometimes 
there's a trade-off where if you enhance one, it's at the expense of another. So um, carbon sequestration value is negated if, as soon as, you know, if you turn your seaweed into a food product as soon as it's eaten. Um, or if somebody's farming a Taonga species for an economic return, that could be in direct conflict with cultural values. So these synergies and trade-offs um, also vary with scale and context. And so if you think about farming um, a small scale or medium scale aquaculture farm, this could have really positive um, bioremediation services. Uh, but if you scale up that farm, either by extent or by increasing the density, or you put that farm in a different location, then all of a sudden, perhaps you're, you're, the seaweed is taking up so much nutrients that the area becomes nutrient limited and there's not enough nutrients left for the ecosystem. So yeah, in summary, there's a range of potential co-benefits that seaweed aquaculture could offer. Um, but they're really scale and context dependent, and in many cases, the research to demonstrate these benefits has yet to be carried out, um, and how these benefits vary in different situations. So seaweed agriculture really requires an ecosystem-based management approach that considers the full suite of risks and benefits of seaweed agriculture, and how these will interact with different industries at different scales and in different locations.